Plus, another Connecticut father who knows the pain of losing a child to gun violence. Mike Song sits down with me to talk about hope in the form of Congress voting on Ethan's Law. Sunday morning, everyone, and welcome to The Real Story. I'm Matt Karen. Right now, funerals are being held for the 19 children and two teachers slain in the worst mass shooting since Sandy Hook. My first guest, unfortunately, intimately knows the unspeakable pain and darkness associated with this kind of a tragedy. Mark Barden's son, Daniel, was killed in Newtown. He has since devoted his life to ending gun violence. As the co-founder of Sandy Hook Promise, Mark, really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Matt. I want to start with this. Since Sandy Hook, Mark, there have been nearly 1,700 mass shootings across the United States. Post Sandy Hook reform, as you know, here in Connecticut has led to some of the toughest state gun laws in the country, but it didn't really do much to move the needle federally. Do you think now is going to be any different? I sure hope so, Matt. And unfortunately, the, the increased awareness on this is um, I mean, it's, it, it's such a high price. Um, However, uh, if there's an opportunity to move the needle and, and to protect folks, um, I, I believe we have to do everything we can. And there is solid evidence. Uh, the, the data shows us that, that um, constitutional uh, gun safety policy works, saves lives. We see it proven over and over again. And it doesn't interfere with people's constitutional right to own a firearm. So let's, let's get this done. Let's get going. I want to put your uh, beautiful little boy up on the screen now. If we could put up uh, Daniel. Um, did a little research on Daniel. I know he loved the ocean. He loved music. He loved soccer, swimming. Um, he was just seven years old. Mark, what are these families in Texas feeling right now, and what is the next step for them? Uh, so, Matt, I, I would just tell you that um, every time there's a mass shooting, on top of the daily drum drumbeat of uh, shootings that go unreported in towns and cities across our country, my heart breaks. Obviously, we were trying to wrap our heads around the fact that uh, innocent grocery shoppers were targeted for being black and shot to death while they were grocery shopping, as we heard the news unfolding from Uvalde. And, um, and then the similarities uh, with, with what we're dealing with from Sandy Hook uh, began to emerge. And my wife and I are just heartbroken for these families. Uh, we're kind of been, we've been kind of subconsciously tracking along uh, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day with, with their process, uh, trying to wrap their heads around this tragic shooting. And um, I would just tell them, hold on to each other, surround yourself with love, uh, the grief process is an, is as individual as our fingerprint, and there is no wrong way to do it. And for, for those who find help and, and comfort, let those who want to help you help you. Let them cook meals for you. Let them support you. Let them be there for you and wrap their arms around you if that would help you. Uh, they can't take the pain away. They can't bring your loved one back. They want to do something. Uh, if it would help you, let them. Um, I think that's good advice. You know, if you read most psychology books as we talk about grief, it lists the stages, right? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Well, let's talk about you for a second. Something about you strikes me that really acceptance isn't part of your equation. I mean, you, you're, you're here today, you're joining me, so you're willing to retell and relive your story and Daniel's story. I'm curious, you know, why and what kind of a toll does that take on you? Yeah, Matt, that's that's a really uh, that's a that's a heavy question. Uh, that there's there's a lot that comes with that, and you know, Daniel, we used to kind of half jokingly refer to him as the caretaker of all living things. He had a very evolved sense of compassion toward others uh, at the early age of seven. Always wanted to help people. Always noticed if somebody was sitting alone and wanted to, uh, you know, be there for them. Um, and even you know, picking up the worms off the sidewalk and putting them in the grass so they didn't burn. He was literally just constantly uh, thinking of others, and um, we just often thought he's going to be, be such a positive light of compassion and uh, and helping other people throughout his life, until his life was taken from him uh, in such a violent and, and horrible way. Mm -hmm. And I feel a very real sense of responsibility to kind of carry his sense of compassion toward others and, and helping, and uh, literally 
uh, my mission is to prevent other families from having to uh, to endure the uh, the pain of of losing a loved one to preventable gun violence and to protect my surviving children, James and Natalie, and protect other families from having to go through this. And, and that's that's exactly what we were doing at Sandy Hook Promise. I want to talk about Sandy Hook Promise. Um, you know, you have a program there called Know the Signs. Uh, from yes. what I read about it, you say that someone who is at risk of hurting others often exhibits prior signals. Um, what are those signals and, and where can this program be implemented? Um, you know, we, we know that we, we, I could even take always out of that equation and say, I mean, there are always warning signs. I mean, not almost, I almost always warning signs when before someone takes, uh, hurts someone else or hurts themselves. Uh, we see it in the aftermath of, of every one of these tragedies that there are warning signs. Uh, and so we've identified every one of those warning signs is, is an opportunity to, to, to help, to intervene, to get that person connected to the help that they need before it becomes a tragedy. Uh, and, and that's what we do at Sandy Hook Promise. We train students uh, and adults how to uh, recognize those warning signs, take it seriously, and act immediately. Uh, we, have, we have so far uh, prevented at least nine school shootings, um, thousands of other acts of violence, hundreds of suicides. Uh, with with students and parents who are, who are trained to recognize those warning signs and they could be uh, very subtle and maybe it turns out to be nothing and that's great um, things like changes in behavior changes in their friend group uh, isolation bullying being bullied uh, fascination with firearms uh, no one of these things is a, is a is a clear indicator that someone is on a pathway to violence but they could be and when combined uh, could be and so we train students how to recognize those warning signs, give them the tools and the training to either tell a trusted adult or use our anonymous reporting system to report a tip and get somebody connected to help. That help might be a conversation with a parent or, or a faith leader, uh, or it might be an intervention from uh, an organization who's trained uh, with how to help that person move them through that crisis right. uh, into a healthier place before it becomes a tragedy. Um, Mark, you know, when we talk about Buffalo and we talk about Uvalde, what happens when the cameras go away, when the phone stops ringing for people asking for interviews, when the chance for change become a little more distant? What happens then? I mean, what can we do now to seize this moment and uh, what happens going forward? Well, unfortunately, Matt, it seems like we're always, uh, you know, within hours of the last mass shooting. So. Um, I'm asking folks. I'm asking folks to take that hurt, that pain, that outrage that you're feeling from Buffalo or Uvalde or the medical center yesterday, um, and and don't let that fade with the news cycle. Hold on to that pain. Don't allow yourself the luxury uh, to soothe yourself. Uh, turn that pain into action and advocacy, and and, and demand that your your legislators um, um, step up, do their jobs, protect their constituents with sensible uh, safety policies, like secure storage, like universal background checks, like extreme risk protection orders, also known as red flag laws, like uh, community-based violence intervention programs like what we do at Sandy Hook Promise. There are so many solutions available to us now. None of them interfere with anyone's Second Amendment rights. All of them are proven to work. Mark, um, what should happen to Robb Elementary School? I wanted to ask you that. You know, there, there's early indications that that building would be raised and a new school would be built, very similar to what happened in Sandy Hook. Is, is that, would that help in the grieving process and in moving forward in your experience? You know, Matt, that decision is up to those families. That is up to the community. Um, that's what we did in Sandy Hook. They, they asked us, what would you like to see happen? And, you know, gave us some options with, with what was available to us. And so I think that's a, that's a very individual, uh, personal decision uh, that the folks there um, uh, in Uvalde need to make. Just uh, this week, Governor Lamont signed a series of bills aimed at expanding access to childhood mental health services, including more social workers in the school, more mobile crisis response units. Units. Uh, does this in any way move the needle? And, and I guess the I guess the question here, as we set this up, is: Can you solve a gun a gun crisis without addressing a mental health crisis? Uh, um, you know, access to good quality mental health care is very important. Um, um, but, but you know, I use caution uh, to not conflate these two uh, when we know that uh, folks suffering mental illness or in a crisis 
are more likely to be the victim of uh, gun violence than to perpetrate it. However, with our trainings and know the signs, we teach our students how to recognize those warning signs and then connect somebody to help. The help has to be available. So uh, I, we are all for um, having trained crisis counselors, mental health uh, counselors, and support systems available uh, to those who need it. And um, we can certainly do better um, uh, in treating mental health just like we do our physical health. You and I uh, were both at a news conference recently together. We saw each other um, with Senators Murphy and Blumenthal. I asked them a question then that I didn't exactly get an answer to, and I'm going to ask you that same question. Is, is government broken, in your opinion? And I'll add to that by saying, you know, do you think there's too much um, lobbying money? You know, are, are, are lawmakers bought and sold by the gun companies? Why do you all this time. Yeah, I remember asking that, that question, Matt, and that's a tricky one um, because the, the, the structure of our government should be able to work. And maybe you're right. Maybe if, if we were to impose, you know, if there were financial incentives uh, removed from the equation, uh, maybe our lawmakers uh, might, might have to approach uh, some of the legislation that's, um, that they're called upon to vote on uh, differently. Um, I, I, I've been shocked to find out uh, just about every possible consumer product available also has a, a lobby uh, component uh, to their to their marketing. And um, I, I'd be curious to know. It's an interesting study to see how much that influences uh, our lawmaking process. Um, whether our system is broken or not, uh, it, it, it's hard to say. But it sure needs help. It sure needs improvement. I could say that. Yeah. I want to end with this. We just have a minute left, Mark. Um, you know, for someone who's watching right now, they feel compelled to act. You mentioned some of the steps that they could take a little bit earlier, but what's the most actionable thing that they can do that would make an appreciable difference? Uh, so poll after poll after poll show us that 90 percent of Americans, uh, and I bet now it's probably higher, uh, want to see something done uh, to just to bring back, to, to, to address the epidemic of, of shootings that we have in this country. Um, and, and so, as I just articulated, there are so many solutions available to us now uh, that are aligned with our Second Amendment rights. And I, I, I just ask everybody to get involved. Help a gun violence prevention organization, either with time or advocacy or dollars. Uh, call your legislators every day and tell them this is an important issue to you. Uh, and because we, we need to start this conversation with the very simple premise that we all want to protect our children, we all want our communities to be safer, and we have the tools available now to do that. Uh, so I'm asking everybody to be part of this. Mark Barden, um, the father of Daniel Barden, CEO of Sandy Hook Promise. Mark, really appreciate you being here today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Coming up next on The Real Story, we broaden out our conversation on guns with another Connecticut father who lost his son to a tragic gun accident. That accident led to a state law and is now up for a vote in Congress.